A special thank you to our main sponsor of the channel, Squarespace. More on that later in the video. Hello everybody, glad you could make it. My name is Kaylee Allen and welcome to my house. I know if you caught Tuesday's video, you'll know that I'm doing a little bit of filming at home today. Basically, I pulled my back. It's not ideal. And we're filming in here and it's quite difficult to keep the camera from overexposing, okay? Because I'm sat right near skylights. My kitchen is filled with light. It's gorgeous. Perfect place for plants as well, you may see behind me. However, I wanted to do this video because not everyone has perfect light. Okay, they just don't. So today I wanna to talk about my low light picks as well as some do's and don'ts for picking plants for a low light situation. Now I'm not gonna go into what is low light, what is high light, because honestly, it's a minefield, it's difficult, it gets really scientific. I'm not going to do that for the purposes of this video. The little nugget of advice I can give to you is if you're thinking, mm, I think I've got low light, you probably do. You probably do. This outclass is highlight, but any other place I've been in, outclass is low light. So here are my top 10 low light house plants for your environment. You may see some trends on here and I'm gonna talk about them a little bit at the end. So the first plant I'd like to talk about today is, I know, I know, just grit your teeth and bear it, just grit your teeth and bear it, guys. It's the Philodendron Gloriosum. Listen. Oh my God, the Philodendron Gloriosum is a fantastic plant. It's just fantastic. It sizes up really well, even in the dark. It's also velvety, which does mean it tends to do better in darker conditions. There's a little, not a full blown rule, but definitely something you could stick to. It is a crawler, which is another thing that I will get onto later. So it's not going to try and climb upwards. It's going to crawl along essentially the floor or pots or whatever it is that you're putting it on. They look stunning. They look stunning if you don't like them what is wrong with you are you okay you get them in a few different types so you can get them in like a dark form a regular form with very muted veining what a lot of people are calling zebra now a white vein whatever you want to call it you can get them more rounder you can get them more pointy generally there's a lot of variety there in gloriosum so if you have certain traits that you prefer you're probably going to find one that's probably going to fit what you want now i get it it depends if you like crawlers or not i know but this is why they're good in low light because they are crawlers. And again, I will get into it later on. It's also a lot more affordable now than it ever has been. So if you're looking for something to fill a spot, it's a really good one to go for. The next plant is so cliche, it's no surprise, right? But there is there is literally a reason why it's no surprise, okay? So the next plant I have on my list is the Monstera Deliciosa. I know, I know, I know. But do you know why Monstera Deliciosa have holes in them? It's because they have adapted to grow in really low light situations. Monstera deliciosa have those holes and those fenestrations quite literally to allow the light to pass from the top of the plant down through the bottom of the plant so it can maximize the light that it gets. That is literally why they have holes in them. Thus meaning they are absolutely perfect for low light situations. And honestly, keep them well fed. They won't get too leggy. Obviously, if you have them in a really, really, really dark corner, the kind of corner where you wouldn't put any plant, then yeah, you're probably gonna get your plant suffering. That's kind of the case with any of the plants on this list. They, these plants don't live in zero light. I'm not making that claim. But Monstera Deliciosa, literally built for this. And that goes for the small and the large form, by the way. It really depends. I feel like the larger form are more, I wanna say they're more adapted to it and they're better built for it than the small form but I appreciate not everyone wants a large form in their house. I mean, I know I do, but you know, gotta think about that space if you feel me. But the Monstera Deliciosa is generally a cracking choice. And I don't personally think you can go wrong with either form, any variation of it, it's gonna be pretty good. Next up, we have the Philodendron Glorious, which is a climber. And I wouldn't usually recommend a climber for a low light situation, but this plant, I don't know what it is. It's just built a little bit different. To be honest, the reason it probably does so well is the Glorious in it. So Philodendron Glorious, if you didn't know, is actually a hybrid of Philodendron Gloriosum and Philodendron Melanochrysum. And honestly, I think the good bits probably come from the Gloriosum in terms of the low light thing. Right. Melanochrysum has some great characteristics, but Gloriosum, it definitely holds the Gloriosum side of it because it sizes up really well and it does well in low light. And in my experience, it doesn't look too leggy. Never say never, but it is a climber that I quite appreciate for looking really nice and plump in a low light situation. I've had them myself. They did do really well. Keep the feed up as with anything low light and you should get a really nice plump 
plant. They're tough as nails, by the way. They prop really well from chunks. And I say this because not every philodendron does, right? I've had hit and miss with these things. They are really, really tough, tough, tough plant. They can handle quite a lot. And I'm forever pruning mine upstairs in the unit just because it keeps growing over the end of the pole and I'm lazy and I just keep cutting it down to have propagations for the shop. Philodendron Glorious, beautiful plant, genuinely has the best of both and it's really easy and it likes low light quite a bit. But there is also another climber I'm going to recommend off the back of that and it's also a hybrid, would you believe? And it has melanocrysum in it. So the hybrid that I would also like to recommend, even though it's a climber, would be Philodendron Splendid, which is essentially Philodendron Vericosum crossed with Philodendron Melanochrysum. Absolutely lovely, lovely plant. Melanochrysum, I didn't really bash it before, but I probably didn't tell you about the good bits. It's just really tough, guys. It's been on a lot of my easy house plant videos for, I think, forever. The only downside of Melanochrysum is it doesn't size up very well. I would say that was the only downside. The rest of it, it's very, very tough. And it is one of these plants that's become a bit more affordable. And I get why. And it's always the tough ones. It's always the tough ones that become more affordable because they're easy to propagate. Supply can meet demand. Blah, 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 blah. That's not what this video is about though. So very cool, some you know what it is? It's hit and miss. It's really hit and miss. There are loads of different types of varicosum. I'm not entirely sure as to which varicosum goes into a splendid. I'm sure there's loads of different ones. But these plants are so good. And if they are underwatered, they just plump straight back up with a bit of water. They're absolutely amazing. And I don't find, again, I don't find that they get too leggy. It's It's got to be something about these three plants that are mushed together. So you've got the Glorious, which is the Gloriosum in it, and you've got the Splendid, which is the Vericosum in it, and then obviously the Melanochrysum. There's just something about this combo that works. I'm not saying every climber is good in low light, because in my opinion, it ain't. We'll get into it later on in the do's and don'ts. However, these two that I've just mentioned are genuinely really good. Absolutely can confirm. I've had both of them growing on either side of my TV in my last apartment, and I love them. I love, 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 love them. Another one I want to recommend, and this is one that it doesn't matter if it gets a little bit leggy because it's a viner, and that is the Monstera Siltipicana. I wanted to put this on this list because we only have, do we have only one? another monster on this list and that would be MD. Yeah, literally. I wanted to put this on there because I have found that it's very, very nice in low light. Not only that, but it is something a little bit different to have trailing. Now you can make it climb. You can, you can. Just if you're in a low light situation, you might want to start trailing it. Then if you have slightly more of a leggy vine, you can kind of get away with it because vines sometimes get like that. So it just tends to be a little bit more socially acceptable. But I absolutely adore this plant. It's still not available, I don't think. Correct me if I'm wrong, guys. It's still not readily available in the UK in big baskets of it. It's still not there. Like we can get a lot of epipremnum and stuff like that. Skindapsis, cool, awesome, but this plant just ain't there yet. It is quite an interesting one to have because not everyone has them. Again, not saying it's rare at all. I'm just saying it's not something that you really see passed around. Maybe no one really wants it. I don't know. Personally, I think it's a fantastic plant and really, really good for a low light situation. Really pretty as well. They've got quite a lot of just a lot going on on the leaf. They've got a nice shape. They've got a little bit of silver, got some nice veinage. They make a really nice plant. If you're looking for a fast and reliable way to create and run your own website, you should give Squarespace a try. Squarespace is an all-in-one solution for creating your own website from scratch using a variety of modern and sleek templates. They're really customizable so you can have a website that's unique to your brand in no time. I've used Squarespace now for well over a year for the Red Plant Shop and it's working really, really well for me. If you don't quite know where to start, you can always use the inbuilt wizard which will guide you towards the recommended templates for the kind of website you would like to make. Once you have your selected template, follow the instructions on screen and you'll be set up in no time. If you want to create a really sleek looking website, either for an online store or maybe you're working on your own blog, check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash Kaylee Ellen to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you very much, Squarespace. And back to the video. 
Similarly, I have to recommend the classic, and this is one that is on every list ever, so I completely appreciate that, and I will whiz over it very quickly, but the philodendron heteraceum, or the heartleaf philodendron, whatever you have it, literally phenomenal plant, phenomenal plant, looks absolutely stunning as well when it vines. You can grow it up, the same thing as the monstera, but it just looks, oh, it just looks so much better trailing in my opinion. I adore these plants. And as soon as I know that my cats are all right with it, I'm going to be probably putting a shelf behind me on this wall, floating shelf, something like that, and I want to put a heart leaf on it. I'll probably have to keep it trimmed. Big shame, because mine is really long, but I cannot wait. These plants are great. And they are so affordable. They are so affordable. You could probably get a nice big bushy one for, in the UK, definitely less than £10. Like, these are really, really, really good. They're pretty much bomb-proof as well, but they don't die. So that, I know, is a classic, but it's a classic for a reason. It's because it works. So the philodendron heteraceum, philodendron scandens, philodendron heartleaf, whatever you want to call it, absolute must-have if you're on a budget and you want something really, really pretty. Again, another vining one, and we will cover this in the do's and don'ts. I've got the Skindapsis Silver Anne. That's just my favorite. There are a few other ones. I think there's Skindapsis Pixus. I can't even say that. Skindapsis Pictus. But I just find the Silver Anne a little bit nicer. It's more silvery. You might not like the silveriness. You might not like it at all. You might like something a bit different. I do have a Skindapsis Rare Plant Index on that if you are interested, if you want to see the different types. There's a whole video. I will link that down below. But for me, that's the nicest one. Now with this, they are slow growing. So I wanted to put that in there because I've said this before, if you have a house where you don't have a lot of space for plants and yes, we all get joy out of growing them, who doesn't? But you don't want something that's gonna go mental. You feel me? You need something that just grows a little bit slower so you can keep on top of it a little bit easier. Skindapsis, as a, an entire thing, Skindapsis, over Monstera, over Philodendron. If you don't want to have to trim it that often, you don't want to see changes too often, you just want something that chills the hell out, then Skindapsis are for you. And like I say, so many different types, so many different types. Have a look at that video if you are interested, because I go through quite a few of them. I probably go through about 20 of them. So there's a lot in there. Next on the list is a plant I have not mentioned in so long. I do have some at the shop, but this goes to show you what I'm talking about. I don't have any photographs of them in the shop per se, but a lot of them have been bleached up under the lights. So I want to recommend these. Now these, some people say they're easy. Some people say they're difficult. I, I'm i on the side of easy, okay? I really am. I really am. I think as long as you've got the humidity and you don't fuss over them too much, you're all right. And that is the Aglaonema Pictum Tricolor. Do you remember when these were all the rage? All the rage. I think they end up not being because I think people don't realize how they actually grow and people think they're going to be nice, cute little stubby plants, but they, ju they just don't really grow like that. They don't really grow like that. Not for your typical person growing it in a house anyway. But I wanted to recommend it for a low light plant because genuinely you can give it adequate light and it'll probably bleach up the leaves quite significantly. I really want to tell you that they will do well in low light. I haven't fully tested it, right? I haven't fully tested it, but I'm quite confident that you can do it. Okay, so take what I'm saying with a pinch of salt. I don't even know how much these things are worth now. I don't even see people taking photos of them. I don't see people talking about them. So let me know what you think and if they've sort of dropped off. But I wanted to bring it back because it's a lovely plant. I should probably sort mine out at the shop because they're a state, but they are so gorgeous. If you like camouflage, this is your plant. This is the plant for you if you like camouflage. 100% perfection. Right, I'm gonna actually recommend another climbing philodendron. I know, I know, but this philodendron is so damn tough, I can't get over it. It is a Marmite philodendron, meaning it's essentially an acquired taste. You might already know what I'm gonna say. Connoisseurs of this channel among you are already shouting the name of the plant at the TV because I use the same metaphor to describe this plant as I ever have done, but I'm talking about the philodendron UPI. Hear me out right? It is a climber. For some reason, it's as tough as nails and it will keep on growing and growing, right? But the cool thing specifically about this climber over the other ones that I've mentioned, so the Philodendron Glorious and the Philodendron Splendid, this climber, the internodal spacing, so the space between the nodes where the petioles come out, that gap in between each, you know, a, a two given petioles, should we say. It's really hard to describe that. But that gap is so small. It's a bit like if you've seen a Spiritus Sancti, Philodendron Spiritus Sancti, it's the same thing. That gap is so, 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 so small. It means they're quite difficult to propagate. However, 
what it does mean is when they get a little bit on the leggy side, so you're in a low light situation, it's only going to end up looking a little bit more like a standard climber because you've got a long way to go before those internodes get silly, if you know what I mean, because they're used to being so, so compact. So for that reason, the fact it's easy care, the fact that it's it's not your average plant, I'm not going to lie, it's not your average plant, it is an acquired taste, it is, it's, it's weird. Let's just be honest, it's weird, but it's fantastic in low light. And I find it difficult to kill them. I literally find it difficult to kill them. I can put them in a dark corner, forget about them, and then I come back to them and they're all big and bushy because they've just they've just thrived on neglect. In a lot of cases, that plant does. So it's quite a tough plant as well. I don't like to recommend plants in these lists that aren't tough because part of a plant being tough probably means it can take low light, if you know what I mean, because it's, it's not quite getting what it needs. So I really, really recommend the Phil Denman UPI. Now, I, I know a lot of people will just be like, Ugh, well, no, but some of you out there might like it. So I've popped it on the list because it is, honestly, it's a top-notch pick. Let's talk about some Thingonium. And again, I have a full rare plant index on this. So if you want to see all the Thingonium that life has to offer, well, not all of it, but a lot of it, then feel free to watch that video. I will leave that down below as well for you for after this video. However, Thingonium, oh, not all of them are amazing, I will say that, but a lot of them genuinely thrive in low light. And not a lot of people know this, but you can grow Syngonium more trailing than you can up as well. So you don't just have to grow them up a pole, you can let them trail. And if you let them trail, they will get smaller anyway, all the leaves and everything, and it will just start to look different. That's not a bad thing in a low light situation because it's just kind of going to look normal, right? So for this video, I've shoved in the Syngonium Wendlandii because it's a really nice one. And it is understated. Yes, it's not colourful. There are tons of colourful ones out there, like literally tons of colourful ones. And again, you can watch my rare plant index on that if you want to see all the different types of Syngonium. I popped in Wendlandii because it's, it's one of my favourites and it is quite affordable. Don't get me wrong, there are so many Syngonium that are affordable. They can be found nearly anywhere, I think, in garden centres, stuff like that. They propagate really well. You can grow them in water, blah, blah, blah. I don't stop talking about Syngonium. But I've popped in that one for the sake of this video, but you can replace it with most. Syngonium. Not all, but most. Most of the Syngonium I know of, they're split into mainly two growth patterns. The larger, more vining growth pattern is generally tougher and more tolerant of low light than the ones that grow very compact, I've found personally. So have a look at all the Syngonium, but there might be one in there that suits your, your color palette, your taste, your style, whatever have you. There are so many and they are fantastic plants. Right, I now want to give you a very quick sort of do's and don'ts for putting plants in your house, aroid plants that is, that are going to be in low light because there's some general themes that you might have picked up on that I've hinted at in this video, but it's also things that I've learned over the years of having plants. So here we go with do's and don'ts. Right. You may have noticed there are no allocation on this list and Lord, I love them. And there are some that do all right in low light, but generally speaking, don't get an alocasia, guys. Just don't get an alocasia. Save an alocasia spot for something that is just generally quite high light. And if you can, if you can, something with a light source above it. For example, my kitchen. No, you can't see, but there are skylights up there. And if I put an alocasia on my kitchen countertop, it would probably do beautifully. It would look so nice. It would look gorgeous. It would grow just like it does in the nurseries because there is a light up above it. So it's not going to do anything weird. It's going to have beautiful paddly leaves and it's going to look very uniform and gorgeous. It can be done in a dark spot. I don't personally like to do it because I find allocation lean a lot. They can get very leggy very quickly, very leggy very quickly, and they lean like no tomorrow. Allocation is definitely a plant that you have to rotate. Right. In a low light situation, you probably can't rotate things that easily. It might just be stacked in a little corner in a nook. And in my experience, again, there are always some that do better than others. Some people's low light situations might just be better than others because low light is not equal either. But I would personally stay away from allocation, guys. I just would. I don't recommend them for low light generally. And that genuinely goes for most of them. Some of the, the stumpier, juicy alocasia are a little bit better. Like for example, black velvet. I love that. And it is easy care, but it's still going to get leggy in low light and it will be noticeable. 
because they're definitely supposed to be stumpy. So you could argue they might be slightly worse than the others. I would not get an alocasia. I would avoid. What I would get in its place, and I've hinted at this in the video, is I would get something like a crawler. If we're sticking to aroids, because I have other recommendations that aren't aroids, but that's not this video. If you want a video on that, I'm happy to do one. But stick to crawlers. Think about how crawlers are in the wild. They literally crawl along the undergrowth in the rainforest. They're used to being at the bottom of the bottom, underneath all the trees, underneath everything. And they will crawl to get where they need to be. That is how they work. They are very, very used to being sat in a very shady spot and just looking big and plump because they need to. They need to maximize the light that they can take in. So most crawlers like Philodendron Gloriosum, Philodendron Plowmanii is a fantastic one. That grows really, really well in low light. I've got a few in the shop. Fantastic. I also have not as good an option, but I have kind of like a weird pastazanum hybrid thing in my shop. That's not bad either. It's a little bit on the leggier side because it's half pastazanum, so I'm not going to recommend it. But things like Gloriosum, Plowmanii, go for those instead. You still get heart shapes or shapes close to an alocasia, but you're not going to have as much of a problem. I guarantee it. You just have to decide whether you can put up with the crawling aspect. My second don't is if you can, maybe don't pick variegates, guys. Maybe don't pick variegates. I'm not saying that variegates can't grow beautifully in a shady spot. Some of them, yes, they can. But as a general rule, I would not gravitate towards variegates. The obvious reasons being they just don't have enough, we'll just say green leaf surface, so enough chlorophyll to deal with the low light. He's just giving them a little bit more of a disadvantage. Again, he's not something you can't do. I'm not saying don't have any variegates. I'm saying if you worried about stuff that's going to die, maybe definitely avoid variegates or stick in a cheap one to see how it does. I recommend Syngonium Albo, something like that, because that that, that shit just thrives. I, I don't even understand it. But generally speaking, variegation is not your best friend at all, I would say, depending on how low light you, know, you have or whatever. Similarly, in terms of variegation, yes, I've just said no variegation. But in addition to that, and this is kind of a pro and a con, and I want to let you decide what it is for you, but things with yellow variegation. I class that as what I like to call Polaroid variegation. So it comes out and you can't necessarily see what's yellow and what's green on a leaf. Take, for example, Monstera aurea, and it takes a little while to fully develop. Now, what can happen in low light is that won't fully develop and it will stay quite green. Now, that is either a pro or a con for you. If you want something that definitely stays variegated, it's probably a con for you. If you just want to make sure your plant adapts well to low light, it's a pro. So I wanted to put that out there just as an extra point to let you decide what what you think of yellow variegation in a low light situation. It could be good for you, it could be bad for you, it's based on personal preference. So what I think you should do is opt obviously for all green plants, but if you're gonna go for something variegated, Try silver instead. Now, I know I've just mentioned that pastazanum that I was just talking about earlier on. That would technically be a really good option because it's something that sort of mimics, mimics variegation. It's interesting, it's good looking, but it's not actual variegation in that sense. You get me? A lot of low light plants, so many low light plants have like a blue tone or a silver tone. Go for that instead. It's probably a much safer bet than trying to go for all out variegates. And they're probably a lot cheaper as well. So that always helps. My third don't is try not to pick a plant that's already leggy. I know I talked about the philodendron UPI earlier on, but that's kind of the exception to the rule, I would say. In general, if you're really worried about plants looking leggy, don't even pick my recommendations. Just don't pick leggy plants or climbing plants or plants with something of a, a large vining nature. Try and get ones, if you're going to anyway, with a short internodal spacing. Like, yes, I mentioned UPI. Philodendron Jose Bono is another really good one. That does have kind of variegation as well. So but that's another one as well. Just be very, very careful because if it looks leggy when it's in good condition, then it might look really leggy in bad condition. You know what I mean? So what I do think you should do, and again, I've hinted at this in the video, is to get something that is vining, but it's like really vining. So things like your heart leaf philodendrons, some of your skin dapsis and stuff like that, and just grow them downwards. Honestly, even though it might look a bit sparse, I genuinely think it's going to look better than how a, say, a varicosum or something like that is crawling up a pole. Because what's going to happen with those poles is, if you get your large internodal spacing, you've now covered the whole pole, and then you're going to have to cut it down and propagate it. When it's just vining, it's taken up real estate that's like mid-air, right? It's just the air. It's not taken up a pole. It's not going to drive you insane. It's just a little bit better. And you can still prune that back. If anything, you can prune it back and shove it into the base and make it bushier. 
right? So there are advantages of pruning back in low light with a vining plant like Skindapsis, Epipremnum even, we haven't really touched on those, like Porthos and stuff like that. All of those things, you've got more an advantage there for pruning in low light than what you would with something that climbs. So if you're really worried about it, honestly, just get something that vines. And Heartleaf is probably the best one on the list for that. So my next don't is do not pick a plant that runs. Don't do it, don't do it. For example, say Monstera Escalito, also known in the past anyway as Monstera Epipremnoides. It's now Escalito, I can't even say that today. What's gonna happen is if you piss that off too much, it's just gonna send out runners. It's not gonna grow at all. You're not gonna have much fun because then you're probably gonna cut the runner and you're gonna try and propagate from it and then you'll have more and then that might not grow. It's not fun, right? And again, everyone is different. Everyone's condition is different. We're all sat here thinking we have low light, but one person's low light is not another. So I'm not saying it's never going to work for you if you want to pick that. But in my experience, I probably wouldn't do that. What I would do, so my do for this point, is to get something that pops generally. Now, I'm not going to say alocasia because obviously we've been through alocasia. They're not good. Colocasia, they're okay. Not a lot different. Caladium aren't too bad. They pop as well. But I would actually recommend maybe aglaonema. If you look at those, they pop, but they're really good in low light. So the classic Chinese evergreen that everyone goes on about, again, has silver variegation. It's ticking a few boxes there, but that will pop like no tomorrow. And all it will do, it will just get bushier. It will just get bushier. So that is honestly better than having something that runs because something that runs is going to look leggier and sparser and nastier. And it's just going to send out these weird shoots, like literally like something out of, I don't know what. A popping plant like an aglaonema rather than something like an alocasia. It's only going to get bushier. It's only going to get bushier. So it's only going to serve you when that thing pops rather than something that runs and you have to start snipping it and your growth's just gone to heck because now you've got runners. So that is my little video on low light aroids. If you'd like me to do a video on non aroids, hint hint, this guy would probably be in it as well with these, then please do let me know in the comments and I will genuinely look further afield than these guys, obviously, and do for you another low light video. But those would be my picks from literally all of the plants that I've kept. So I will leave any videos that I've talked about, namely the Rare Plant Indexes, down below in the description. Similarly, I do have a Rare Plant Index playlist on my channel, or just search Rare Plant Index and you will probably find it. That is it for this week's video. If you like this video, please leave a like down below. It lets me know that I'm making content that you enjoy. And if you'd like to see more of my content and never miss an upload, then feel free to hit that subscribe button. And if you like, you can turn on that little bell, which notifies you every time I post. Because fun fact, YouTube doesn't always pop up with content from creators. That won't just be me. That'll be with a few of your other favorites as well. So the best way to get around that, to be quite honest, is to click the little bell. That's it for this week's video guys i hope you've enjoyed it i certainly have and i will see you in the next one bye